The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, SA10, Value System Disorder, Part 2. Success and Status. Underlying the capitalist model is an implied assumption that those who contribute the most must gain the most. In other words, it is assumed that to become, say, a billionaire, you must have done something important and helpful for society. Of course, this is clearly untrue. The vast majority of extremely wealthy people originate their wealth out of mechanisms that are not socially contributive on any direct creative level when broken down and analyzed. The act of engineering, problem solving, and creative innovation almost always occurs on the level of the laborer in the lower echelons of the corporate complex, only to be capitalized upon by those at the top, owners, who are skilled at the contrived game of generating a market. This is not to discount the intelligence or hard work of those who hold vast wealth, but to show that the rewards of the system are displaced, allocated to those who exploit the mechanisms of the market, not those who actually engineer and create. In fact, one of the most rewarded sectors of the global economy today is that of investment and finance. This is a classic example as to be a hedge fund manager moving money around for the mere sake of gaining more money with zero contribution to creative development is one of the highest paid occupations in the world today. Likewise, the very notion of success in the culture today is measured by material wealth in and of itself. Fame, power, and other gestures of attention go hand in hand with material wealth. To be poor is to be abhorred, while to be rich is to be admired. Across almost the entire social spectrum, those of high levels of wealth are treated with immense respect. Part of this has to do with a system-oriented survival mechanism, such as the personal interest in gaining insight into how to also become such a success. But overall, it has morphed into a strange fetish where the idea of being rich, powerful, and famous by whatever means necessary is a guiding force. The value system disorder of rewarding, in effect, generally the most ruthless and selfish in our society, both by financial means and then by public adoration and respect, is one of the most pervasive and insidious consequences of the incentive system inherent to the capitalist model. <clears throat> it not only works to bypass true interests in types of innovation and problem solving, which inherently do not have monetary return, it also reinforces the market system's own existence, justifying itself by way of high status attainment for those who win in the system, regardless of true contribution or the social and environmental costs. <coughs> Sociologist Thorsten Veblen wrote extensively on this issue, referring to this value, virtue, as predatory. Quote, as the predatory culture reaches a fuller development, there comes a distinction between employments. The honorable man must not only show capacity for predatory exploit, but he must also avoid entanglement with occupations that do not involve exploit. The tame employments, those that involve no obvious destruction of life and no spectacular coercion of refractory antagonists, fall into disrepute and are relegated to those members of the community who are defective in the predatory capacity. That is to say, those who are lacking massiveness, agility, or ferocity. Therefore, the able-bodied barbarian of the predatory culture, who is mindful of his good name, puts in his time in the manly arts of war and devotes his talents to devising ways and means of disturbing the peace. That way lies honor." End quote. <clears throat> William Thompson, in his An Inquiry into the Principles of the Distribution of Wealth Most Conducive to Human Happiness, restates the reality of this associative influence. Our next position is that excessive wealth excites the admiration and the imitation and in this way diffuses the practice of the vices of the rich 
amongst the rest of the community or produces in them other vices arising out of their relative situation to the excessively rich. On this point, nothing is more obvious than the universal operation of the most common principle of our nature, that of association. The wealth as a means of happiness is admired or envied by all. The manner and character connected with the abundance of these good things always strike the mind in conjunction with them. Classes and class warfare are a natural outgrowth of this as the value associations to wealth and power manifest by the current system become an issue of emotional identity over time. The status interest begins to take on a life of its own and it generates actions of self-preservation on the part of the upper class that seek to maintain or elevate their status in ways that might not even relate to money or material wealth anymore. Self-preservation in this case extends to a kind of drug addiction. Just as a chronic gambler needs the endorphin rush of winning to feel good, those in the upper class often develop similar compulsions in relationship to the state of their perceived status and wealth. The term greed is often used to differentiate between those who exploit modestly and those who exploit excessively. Greed is hence a relative notion, just as being rich is a relative notion. The term relative deprivation refers to the discontent people feel when they compare their positions to others and realize that they have less of what they believe themselves to be entitled to. This psychological phenomenon knows no end, and within the context of the material success incentive system of capitalism, its presence as a severe value system disorder is apparent on the level of mental health. <clears throat> While maintaining a needs meeting quality standard of living is important for physical and mental health, anything beyond that balance in the context of social comparison has the capacity to create severe neurosis and social distortion. Not only is there no winning in the end when it comes to the subjective perception of status and wealth, it often serves to decouple those figures from the majority of the human experience, generating alienation and dehumanization in many ways. This empathic loss has no positive outcome on the social level. The predatory reward values inherent to the market system virtually guarantee endless conflict and abuse. Of course, the myth is that this neurosis of seeking more and more status and wealth is the core driver of social progress and innovation. While there might be some basic truth to this intuitive assumption, the intent again is not social contribution, but advantage and financial gain. It is like saying being chased by a pack of hungry wolves ready to eat you is good for your health, since it is keeping you running. While certain accomplishments are clearly occurring, the guiding force, intent, again, has little to do with those accomplishments and the detrimental byproducts and larger order paralysis inherent nullifies in comparison the idea that the values of competition, material greed, and vain status is a legitimate source of societal progress. In fact, epidemiologist Richard Wilkinson has extrapolated a comparison of wealthy nations oriented by the income disparity present in each population. It was found that those nations with the least income disparity actually were more innovative. And when we consider that the competitive value drive has a large role with respect to how severe the gap between the rich and poor is, it is axiomatic to consider that the values of egalitarianism and collaboration have more creative power than the traditional economic incentive rhetoric would claim. As a final point in this subsection, the subject of materialism and status can be extended to the similar issue of vanity as well. While a mild deviation from our point, the vanity-based culture we have today finds a direct relationship to these drives for status and measures of success rooted in the psychological value incentives inherent to the capitalist system. Given that the value system of acquisition is in fact necessary for the consumption model to work, it is only natural that marketing and advertising generate dissatisfaction continually. 
including in the way we feel about our physical appearance. In fact, a study was conducted some years ago on the island of Fiji in, what, in which Western television was introduced to a culture that had never experienced the medium before. By the end of the observation period, the effect of materialistic values and vanity took a powerful toll. A relevant percentage of young women, for example, who prior had embraced the style of healthy weight and full features became obsessed with being thin. Eating disorders, which were virtually unheard of in this culture, began to spread and women specifically were transformed. <clears throat> Ideological polarization and blame. When the subject of what has gone wrong with the world today is broached, given the poverty, ecological imbalance, inhumanity, general economic destabilization, and the like, a polarized debate often ensues. Dualities such as the right or the left, or liberal or conservative, are common, implying that in the range of human comprehension and preference, there is a rigid guiding line that embodies all known possibilities. Paired with this is also the older, yet still common duality of collectivism versus free market. In short, this duality assumes that all options of economic preference must adhere to the idea that society should either be based on the supposed democratic will of all the people in the form of free trade, or that a small group of people should be in control and tell everyone else what to do. Due to the dark history of totalitarianism that plagued the 20th century, a fear-based value orientation, which rejects anything that even remotely hints at the appearance of collectivism, is extremely common today, with the related word socialism often used in a derogatory way. As noted prior in this essay, people's sense of possibility is directly related to their knowledge, what they have learned. If traditional educational and social institutions present all socio-economic variation within the confines of such boxed frames of reference, people will likely mirror this assumption, mean, and perpetuate it in thought and practice. If you are not ABC, then you must be XYZ. This is the common thought mean. Even the political establishment of the United States exists in this paradigm, for if you are not a Republican, you must be a Democrat, etc. In other words, there is a direct inhibition of possibility, and in this context, it often manifests a value structure that builds emotional attachments to false dualities. These values are extreme barriers to progress today on many levels. In fact, as an aside, if the intention of a ruling class were to limit any interference from the lower classes, they would protectively work to limit people's sense of possibility. For example, the supposed problem of state intervention of the free market, a constant theme of capitalist apologists, essentially says that since various policies and practices of the government limit free trade in some way, this is the source of the problem generating market inefficiency. This blame game actually goes back and forth between those who claim it is the market that is the problem and those who claim it is the state's interference with the market. What isn't talked about is the duality shattering reality that the state in its historical form is an extension of the capitalist system itself. The government did not create the system. The system created the government, or more accurately, they evolved as one apparatus. All socioeconomic systems root themselves in the basis of industrial unfolding and basic survival. Just as feudalism being based on an agrarian society oriented its class structure in relationships to the livelihood producing land, so do the so-called democracies in the world today. Therefore, the idea that the state government is detached or without the influence of capitalism is a purely abstract theory with no truth in reality. Capitalism essentially molded the governmental apparatus's nature and unfolding, not the other way around. So when people argue that government regulation of the market is the root of the problem and that the market should be free without structural or legal inhibition, they are confused in their associative understanding. 
the entire legal system, which is the central tool of government, will always be infiltrated and used to insist and used to assist in competitive tactics by business to maintain and increase advantage, since that is the very nature of the game. To expect anything else is to assume that there are actually moral limits to the act of competition. Yet this is completely subjective. Such moral and ethical assumptions have no empirical basis, especially when the very nature of the socioeconomic system is oriented around power, exploitation, and competition, all considered to be, in fact, ideal virtues of the good businessman, as noted before. If a profit-seeking institution can gain power in the government, which is the exact intent of corporate lobbying, and manipulate the government apparatus to favor their business or industry to gain advantage, then that is simply good business. It is only when the competitive attacks reach peak levels of unfairness that action is taken to preserve the illusion of balance. We see this with antitrust laws and the like. These laws are in reality not to protect free trade or the like, but to settle extreme acts of competitive intent inherent in the marketplace, with all sides jockeying for advantage by whatever means possible. <clears throat> Even the very constituents of all governments in the world today are invariably of the corporate business class. Hence, deep business values are clearly inherent in the mindsets of those in power. Thorsten Veblen wrote of this reality in the early 20th century. The responsible officials and their chief administrative officers, so much as may at all reasonably be called the government or the administration, are invariably and characteristically drawn from these beneficiary classes, nobles, gentlemen, or businessmen, which all come to the same thing for the purpose in hand, the point of it all being that the common man does not come within these precincts and does not share in these councils that are assumed to guide the destiny of the nations. <clears throat> so to argue that the free market is not free due to intervention is to misunderstand what the nature of free really means with respect to the system. The freedom is not the freedom of everyone to be able to fairly participate in the open market and all the utopian rhetoric we hear about today by apologists of the capitalist system. The real freedom is actually the freedom to dominate, suppress, and beat other businesses by whatever competitive means possible. In this, no level playing field is possible. In fact, if the government did not interfere by way of monopoly slash antitrust laws or the bailing out of banks and the like, the entire market complex would have self-destructed a long time ago. In part, this inherent instability of the market is what economists like John Maynard Keynes basically understood, but arguably to a limited extent. <clears throat> Individuality and freedom. All too often, people speak of freedom in a way that is more of an indescribable gesture than a tangible circumstance. We hear this rhetoric in the political and economic establishments constantly today, where associations of democracy are made to this freedom, both on the level of the traditional practice of voting and the movement of money itself via independent free trade. These socio-political memes are also reinforced in a polarized way, relatively, which often uses examples of oppression and the loss of freedom and liberty in prior social systems to defend the current state of affairs. The creative works of philosophers, artists, and writers who have been influential in furthering various ideological notions of this freedom, often at the expense of societal vulnerability increasing this dogmatic polarization has further compounded these values. In short, a great deal of fear and emotional power exists around the notion of social change and how it might affect our lives in the way of liberty and individuality. <clears throat> Yet if we step back and think about what freedom means away from these cultural memes, we find that notions of freedom can be argued as relative given human history along with standards of living and even personal expression itself. Therefore, in order to decide what freedom is and how to qualify it, 
we need to measure it from an A, historical perspective on one side, and with respect to B, future possibility on the other. A. <clears throat> Historically, the fundamental concern is based on the fear of power and the abuse of power. Human history, in part, is certainly one of perpetual power struggles, fueled by deeply divisive religious and philosophical beliefs and values, which manifested abject slavery, the subjugation of women, periodic genocide, prosecution for heresy, free speech, or what was and still is known as free thought the divine right of kings, and the like. <clears throat> it could be argued that human history in this context is a history of dangerous, unfounded superstitions made sacrosanct by primitive values, understanding, in those periods of time at the expense of human well-being and social balance. The fear and scarcity of these earlier periods appears to have amplified the worst of what we might consider human nature, often seeking power as a way to avoid the abuse of power in a vicious cycle. Yet it is critically important to notice that we have been in a process of transition away from these archaic values and beliefs overall, with the global culture and its institutions slowly embracing scientific causality and its merit with respect to what is real and what isn't. With this, certain positive trends have become clear. We have moved from the divine, ultimate power of genetically determined kings and pharaohs into a system of very limited, yet general public participation via a so-called democratic process in most of the world. Human exploitation, subjugation, and abject slavery has lost its common defenses of religious, racial, or gender superiority, and improved to the extent that the slavery today overall takes the less severe form of wage labor in the larger context of class associations as determined by one's place in the economic hierarchy. <clears throat> the market economy in all its historical forms has also been able to overcome the race-like caste predeterminations as well since it does allow a level of limited social mobility in the community where income gained facilitates more general freedom. Such progressive realities need to be taken into account as capitalism, with all its flaws, has served to help improve certain things in the social condition. Yet what hasn't changed is the underlying premise that it <clears throat> that is still elitist and bigoted in how it favors one group over another, both structurally and sociologically. Only in this case, the group favored has nothing much to do with gender, race, or religion anymore, but to do with a kind of forceful expedience and competitive mentality that pushes itself to the top of the class hierarchy at the inevitable expense of others. Capitalism, it could well be argued, is really a postmodern slavery system with a new value orientation of competitive freedom holding it in place. This reinvented notion of freedom basically says that we are all free to compete with each other and take what we can. Yet, as noted before, such a state of open freedom existing without abuse, oppression, and structural advantage is clearly impossible. So while proponents of capitalism may adduce the social improvements which have occurred since its advent as evidence of its social efficacy, we must acknowledge that its root form is not in the interest of human freedom, but an echo of social bigotry which has been polluting culture for thousands of years, rooted in a general psychology of elitism and scarcity. Today, true freedom is directly related to the amount of money a person has. Those below the poverty line have severe limitations on personal freedom as compared to the wealthy. Likewise, while proponents of the free market often talk about coercion in the context of state power, the reality of economic coercion is ignored. Traditional economic theorists constantly use rhetoric that suggests that everything is an issue of choice in the market, and if a person wishes to take a job or not, it is their choice. <clears throat> Yet those in poverty, which is the majority, face a severe reduction of choice. The pressure of their limited economic capacity creates a powerful state of coercion by which they not only must take labor roles they might not appreciate to survive, 
they are often subject to vast exploitation in the form of low wage rates due to that same desperation. In fact, general poverty in this context is a very positive condition for the capitalist class, for it ensures cost efficiency in the form of cheap labor. So again, while we may have seen some societal improvement over time, this improvement is really just a variation of the common theme of general elitism, exploitation, and bigotry. The long history of assumed resource scarcity and limits on production have also compounded this idea. In the Malthusian sense, where the idea of everyone finding some level of economic equality was deemed simply impossible. B. Yet modern science and the exponential development of technical application, along with a deeper awareness of our human condition, has opened the door to future possibilities for social improvement, and in fact, a further elevation of freedom in ways never before seen. This awareness presents a problem since the possibility of achieving this new level is deeply inhibited by the values and establishments set forth by the traditional capitalist social order. In other words, the market system simply cannot facilitate these improvements because the nature of their culmination is against the very mechanisms of the system. For example, the efficiency made possible on the technical scientific level today, if correctly applied, could provide a high standard of living for every human on earth coupled with the removing of dangerous and monotonous labor through the application of cybernated mechanization. In the world today, the vast majority of people spend most of their life working in occupation and sleeping. Many of these occupations are not enjoyed and are arguably irrelevant with respect to true personal or social contribution and development. So if we wish to think about what freedom means on a basic level, it means being able to direct your life in the way you wish, within reason. Being able to live your life without worrying about your basic survival and health or that of your family is the first step. Likewise, the labor for income system is one of the most unfree institutions that could exist today, not only with respect to the inherent economic coercion, but also with respect to the corporate structure itself, which is quite literally a top-down hierarchical dictatorship. Sadly, even with these possibilities present and real, the value system disorder built from the capitalist model and its rather paranoid fear of anything outside of it has and will continue to fight these possibilities for more elevated states of freedom. In fact, the very idea of providing basic social support in the, in the form of welfare or the like is attacked in part on the basis of its avoidance of facilitating the open market, the very market that, in reality, likely created the impoverished state of those who need such assistance. As a final note on the subject of freedom, capitalist theory, both historical and modern, is devoid of any relationship to the Earth's resources and its governing ecological laws. Apart from the most primitive awareness of scarcity, which is a marker of the common supply and demand value theory, the scientific nature of the world is absent in this model. It is external. This omission, paired with the exploitation and cost-reducing reality inherent to the incentive system of the market, is what has generated the vast environmental problems, from soil depletion to pollution, to deforestation, to virtually everything else we can think of on the ecological level. In analyzing the early development of this philosophy, we can logically speculate about how this came to be. Given the largely agrarian base of production and the minimalism of early handicraft type good production, our capacity at that time to negatively affect the environment was inherently limited we simply did not pose as much of a threat since the vast edifice of industry as we know it today had not evolved. This development reveals that under the surface of capitalism is an old perspective which is growing increasingly out of date with ever occurring repercussions resulting as our technological capacity increases our ability to affect the world. A parallel would be the institution of war. 
Competitive values and warfare were a tolerable reality when the damage done was limited to primitive muskets centuries ago. Today we have nuclear weapons that can destroy everything. So taking an evolutionary view, capitalism has been a practice and value orientation that did help progress in certain ways, but all trend evidence now shows that the inherent immaturity of the system will lead to ever-increasing problems if it persists. The Marketization of Life As a final point of this essay, the trend of the ever-increasing marketization of life has created a deep distortion of values in the world. Since freedom has been culturally associated with democracy, and democracy in the economic sense has been associated with the ability to buy and sell, the commodification of just about everything one can think of has been occurring. Traditional values and rhetoric of prior generations have often viewed the use of money in some ways as something of a cold necessity, with some elements of our lives considered sacred and not for sale. The act of prostitution, for example, in which people sell intimacy for money, is a situation where cultural values usually find alienation. In most countries, the act is illegal, even though there is little legal justification, since sexual engagement itself is legal. It is only when the element of purchase comes into play is it deemed reprehensible. However, such sanctities that have been culturally perpetuated are becoming increasingly overturned by the market mindset. Today, whether legal or not, nearly anything can be bought or sold. You can buy the right to bypass carbon emissions regulations. You can upgrade your prison cell for a, free, for a fee. Buy the right to hunt endangered animals and even buy your way into a prestigious university without meeting testing requirements. It becomes a strange state when some of the most normal natural acts of human life become incentivized by money as well, such as how it is being used to encourage children to read or encourage weight loss. <clears throat> Psychologically, what does it mean for a child when they are reinforced with money for their most basic actions? How will this affect their future sense of reward? These are important questions in a world for sale with the guiding value principle that it is only when one makes money from an action is that action worth doing. Such market values appear as a clear social distortion as the very essence of human initiative and existence is being transformed. While we might not take much extreme concern over seemingly trivial issues such as the fact one can purchase access to the carpool lane while driving solo, the larger manifestation of a culture built on the edifice of everything being for sale is the dehumanization of society as everyone and everything is reduced to a mere commodity for exploit. Today, as shocking as it is, there are actually more slaves in the world than any time in human history. Human trafficking has and continues to be a massive industry for profit, selling men, women, and children into various roles. The U.S. Department of State has published, it is estimated that as many as 27 million men, women, and children around the world are victims of what is now often described with the umbrella term human trafficking. <clears throat> the work that remains in combating this crime is the work of fulfilling the promise of freedom, freedom from slavery for those exploited, and the freedom for survivors to carry on with their lives. In the end, while most people who believe in the free market capitalist system would ethically stand in outrage at these vast human abuses occurring in the world, usually making distinctions between moral and amoral forms of trade, the fact of the matter is that the commodification concept itself can draw no objective lines, <clears throat> and such extreme realities are in truth simply a matter of degree with respect to application. From a purely philosophical standpoint, there is no technical difference between any form of market exploitation. The psychology inherent, the value system disorder, has and will continue to perpetuate a predatory disregard within the culture. And it is only when that structural mechanism is removed from our very approach to societal organization will the aforementioned issues find resolution. <clears throat>